Mitch tells his story about his boss. See, Mitch lives in Nashville, Tennessee, and his boss was at home one night and was asleep, and his phone rang around 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. Uh, he woke up and he looked at the caller ID, and he recognized that the area code and the prefix were actually from his hometown of Macon, Georgia. So he decided to answer the phone, and it was a good thing that he did because it was an emergency room doctor on the other end from the local hospital. And his mother had been brought to the hospital. She's 86 years old, and the doctors think that she's had a heart attack, and her condition's pretty serious. And so this guy went and he put his clothes in his bag, and, and he got on the road. He drove six hours from Nashville to Macon. And when he got to the hospital, he stopped and he, he, he found a doctor to get an update on his mother's situation. The news was actually fairly good. The doctor told him that he didn't believe that his mother had actually had a heart attack, that the test came back and didn't find that to be the case. But the more they investigated, the more they studied, the more they looked into the matter, it seemed that his mother's condition, her event, may have been sparked because of stress and anxiety. And so this really just had the son confused. He was just baffled. And, and so he went and he got his way into his mother's room and he sat down with her. He said, Mom, what's wrong? What, what's up? Mom, you have a, a family that loves you. Your children and your grandchildren are doing very well. You've got a church family that thinks the world of you. And, and Mom, in all fairness, and when, when you do die, that you know where you're going. So what have you done? What has prompted this, uh, this event? That, what, what's been going on? What are, what are you concerned about? Where, what's been going on? And his mom told him, said, well, you know, I really haven't been doing anything. I've just been staying at home and been sitting in my chair and been watching television. He said, well, mom, what have you been watching? And she said, well, I've been just sitting in my chair and watching CNN all the time. Now, in all fairness, that could have easily been Fox News or MSNBC, but in this case, it was watching CNN. Hey, you know, I understand how that stress and anxiety can, can grow because of watching television, particularly these 24-hour news cycles, because if we watch and we look at the television, there's this line at the bottom of it. And what does that line always say? Breaking news, urgent there's always something, or there's always a situation. In fact, Wolf Blitzer will always have a situation room because it seems like there's always a situation going on. And in the case of this 86-year-old mother, constantly being bombarded with this stress and anxiety of the world's issues prompted her to have an event that had impacted her mentally and physically. Now, over this past month, we've been talking a lot about stress, and today is the last lesson in that series. But through this whole series, we've been on this journey to go from chaos to a life of calm. But we've recognized, we've talked a lot about stress and anxiety, and we've made a pretty big deal of trying to differentiate between the two, that stress is temporary. Stress is something that has a beginning and it has an end. It's like having to complete this school project or this this project for work. It has a beginning and it has an end. Anxiety, though, that's different because anxiety is a constant stress. It is a constant burden, or as Scripture tells us, a burden of the heart. I hope you remember last Sunday morning we looked at a particular passage, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. It's there that the old fisherman writes, he said, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. And if you'll remember, one of the things we talked about was to make that our prayer. That, Lord, I cast all my cares on you because I know you care for me. Lord, I cast my anxiety on you because I know you care for me. Now, here's what I wonder. I wonder over the last week of how many of us have actually been able to do that. That in the midst of something stressful that comes up, we say, Lord, I'm giving this to you. I cast all my anxiety on you because I know you care for me. 
Or has it been one of those things that when we had that care and we tried to cast it to God that we immediately started reeling it back in? You see, it's important if we're to learn anything from this series that we learn to cast our cares onto God because He cares for us. Now, there has been one passage of Scripture that each week we've used as our center and as our focus. That passage is Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 4. We return there one more time this morning. Paul writes, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Now, if we look at this path from chaos to calm, we remember how important it is to celebrate God's goodness. Rejoice in the Lord always, Paul would write it again. He said, I'll say it again, rejoice. We celebrate God's goodness. But we also ask God for help. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. But we also know it's not just celebrating God's goodness and it's also not just asking God for help, but it's it's leaving our concern with God. Then what is it that Paul says? He says that we can have the peace of God that transcends all understanding. But the only way that's going to happen is when we leave our anxiety with God. And so that brings us this morning. Now, we've unpacked these other verses, but it's time for us to get to verse 8. Philippians 4, verse 8, where we want to look at this idea of meditating on good things. Paul writes, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Here's the thing, church. If we're going to move from a life of chaos to a life of calm, we must change the way we think. We've got to start and get to a point where we think about good things. So I have just a few points I want to leave with us this morning and then we're done. And the first one is this, that we can control our thoughts. Uh, now, Johnny, are you sure about that? Yes, I am sure about that because the Bible tells us so. I'm reminded of what Paul says, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. I'm reminded of our old friend Buddy Bell and he makes this analogy. He talks about the fact of comparing us to air traffic controllers. Air traffic controllers can't always control what flies around in the skies around them. But one thing that air traffic controllers can do is they can control what lands. And so it is with us, church, that we can't control circumstances that happen around us. We can't say what, can't change what people say to us. We can't change what people say about us. But something we can do, we can't control what flies around us, but we can control what lands. And so it's important that we do that. By the way, this is interesting. Paul says that. He says, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Now, here's the deal. Paul would have never commanded something if we didn't have a choice. He would have never commanded something if it was something we couldn't do. But he commands us to think about such things. The second point is this. It actually comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. And here's the point. We can pick what we ponder We can pick what we ponder. Uh, 2 Corinthians 10.5, Paul writes, We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Man, we can't control what flies, but we can control what lands. You know, there are thoughts that are contrary to the will of God. They don't have to land. There are things that we need to ponder. Paul says those are things that we need to capture 
for Christ. We need to bring them under Christ's control. And we need to make them obedient to Christ. Now, I think about this series and where we are so far, and, and I just have to stop and tell you that I've had to stop and I've really had to take inventory of the things that I've preached every Sunday. Because I know that when I... Th- when I preach these things that I go home and I sit across the table and here I am, my children are around me and they look at me and they know me better than anybody else. And so they're hearing what I preach on Sunday but they're seeing the struggles that I have through the week and one of the things that I have to understand, I have to share with them but I share with you as well. I'm not preaching something that's been easy for me to preach. I've preached to myself Monday through Saturday in order to be able to proclaim these things on Sunday. And it's been interesting. This is one of the most uh, interesting sermon series I've had had more response from you as a congregation than any other series I've ever preached. I'm firmly convinced of that for two reasons. First of all, because I'm preaching to me. And second of all, maybe I'm preaching something that hits home with you as well. So we can control our thoughts. But church, we have to pick what we can ponder. Let's get to point number three. And this is an interesting one. It's an important one for us to consider. What we think about our problem may be our biggest problem. What we think about our problem may be our biggest problem. I like these words. I've traced them back to Charles Swindoll who wrote, life is 10% of what happens to you and 90% how you react to it. You know, we, we can't control what flies, but we can control what lands. We have to capture these thoughts, these good thoughts, and make them obedient to Christ. You know, a lot of us uh, hear something like this, and, and we keep talking, and, and, and what we say is, you know, I really need to work on that. And I have to be honest with you, the one thing that I've learned is that when people say, I need to work on that, I need to work on that, and oftentimes we don't work on that. Because we need a good plan, we need a plan of action. You know, we're a lot like this this little boy, he was in preschool, and, and he went there and he came home and his mom asked him, said, hey, what was your favorite part of the day? He said, the slide. He said, well, what about the worst part? What did you not like? He goes, the nap. And I, I get it. In fact, the mom went to the school and was talking with the teacher, and, and the teacher was saying, you're, you're right, your son loves to slide, but he does not like to take a nap. And in, in fact, when he lays down, he lays down and he says these things to himself over and over. Go to sleep, don't talk, lay down. Go to sleep, don't talk, lay down. Go to sleep, don't talk, lay down. Now he says that to himself over and over again, but you know what he does? He says it out loud. He doesn't go to sleep. And he doesn't stop talking. He has perfectly good intentions, but he's got a wrong path toward trying to work his solution to that. You see, we've we've got to come to a point where we pick a good solution. We've got to make some changes in the way we think. Now let's get to our fourth point, and that is this, that we need to use our imagination. Now, and let me explain that if I can. And we're told to do things that are, to think about things that are true, noble, right, pure, lovely, and admirable. And so we keep repeating that list to ourselves, that we need to think about things that are true, noble, right, pure, lovely, and admirable. But you know what happens? Those are the things that we are told to think about. Those are the good things. But it comes so easy to think about the negative things. I'm reminded too of what Paul told the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. He says, however it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no human mind has conceived the things that God has prepared for those who love Him. And yes, church, we will understand that there will be a point God has prepared something good for us in eternity, and heaven is going to be something like we cannot even explain it. But there's a lot of good life to be lived here. And we need to hear that. We need to understand that. I think about the way that a lot of us approach life, that a lot of us individually, if we look at our life, are we going to look at the positive or are we going to look at the negative? Well, a lot of us look at the negative. 
When we think about our family and the things going on in our family, are we going to focus on the positive or do we focus on the negative? Because a lot of people tend to focus on the negative. And here we go, because I need to talk about this. And then when we start talking about church, and we've got a lot of positive and a lot of negative, and what is it that we tend to focus on? We tend to focus on the negative. Church, what Paul would tell us, we need to use our imagination and we need to think about things that are good, that are excellent, and that are praiseworthy. So I think about the struggle that we have in our lives individually. That we think that life is so bad. If, if that's the case with you, can I ask you to do this? Man, take a sheet of paper, put it in your pocket, get a pen or a pencil. And as you go through your day, write down things where God has blessed us. Because you know what I think we're quickly going to find? is that God has been so very good to us. We start thinking about our family and the struggles we have, that if we start writing down these good things, you know what we're going to find? is that God has been so very good to us. And here we go. Because in church, what I see and what I hear so often is we look at the negative. We talk about what the church didn't do for me or, or who didn't speak or didn't do that for me. And, and I have to tell you something. I have to be honest enough with you. There are times we just miss. There are times you get overlooked. And it's not intentional. It's not intended to hurt you. But, but I, I look at people and there are people that are not here today because they are convinced of where the church missed something or where the church, somebody didn't talk to them or didn't do this or didn't do the other. But you know what? In every single case, if you'd give me a little bit of time and we could sit down and you may want to talk about what the church didn't do here, I think what I could do is to sit down and point to you over and over and over again of where the church has done good things for us. Maybe we need to stop looking at the negative and we need to start looking at the positive of what God has done for us and what the church has done for us. Church, we need to change the way we think. We need to start looking at the good and not just at the negative. All right, so we can control our thoughts. We need to pick what we can ponder and, and, and how we think about our problem may be our biggest problem. We need to use our imagination. Look for the good. And then one final thought is we need to imitate a godly example. And that brings us back to the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 1 is where I'd like for us to close our time together. Because what we do is we see Paul who is talked about thinking good things and he gives us an example of where he's put that into practice in his own life. In Philippians chapter 1, if you remember these three words, chains, critics, and crisis. We think about chains. Paul has been arrested. Man, things have really changed for him. He used to be able to go out and preach wherever he wanted to. Well, he can't do that now because now he's in chains and he's stuck. But how does he respond to that? We look in Philippians chapter 1, verse 12, where Paul says, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. Well, there, Paul, there is a positive way to look at a difficult situation. I'm in chains, but it has, as a result, it's advanced the gospel. And then we think about these critics. These were men that had been getting up and they were preaching. But while they were preaching, they were going through and they were taking pot shots at Paul. They were trying to cut him down. They were trying to undermine him. But I love the way that Paul looks at that in Philippians 1.18. He says, but what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. And yes, I will continue to rejoice. Wow. In the midst of a difficult situation, Paul looks at the positive. And then there's the crisis, the real life crisis, a matter of life and death that Paul faces. He doesn't know whether he's going to live and make it out of this deal or whether he's going to die. But his conclusion of the matter is in Philippians 1.21 where he says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Man, for Paul, it's a win-win. 
But Paul can look at a difficult situation and he can find the positive because Paul has changed the way he thinks. So do we remember our path from chaos to calm? We need to understand that we can control our thoughts. We can't control what flies around us, but we can control what lands. We can pick what we ponder. We take those thoughts, we capture them, and we make them obedient to Christ. Oh, what we think about our problem may be our worst problem, and so we want to, to look at that, and we want to make sure that we're looking at a way to address our problems that lead to real long-term results. Oh, church, we need to use our imagination. We need to get to a point where we stop just looking at the negative in life, but we start looking at the positive. We don't look at what people haven't done for us. We look at what people have done for us. We stop complaining about this, that, or the other, and we realize that we are richly blessed. And then finally, we follow the biblical example of the Apostle Paul. In fact, he's the one that in 1 Corinthians 11, 1 would say, follow my example as I follow Christ. We follow his example that even in the midst of the most difficult circumstances that he chose to have a positive attitude, to look for the good, to see God's blessing and to see God's hand in it. Eugene Peterson, as he was uh, putting uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, he put it in his own words. I like the way that he says this. He says, summing it all up, friends, I say, you'll do best by filling your minds in meditating on things that are true, noble, reputable, authentic, compelling, gracious, the best and not the worst, the beautiful and not the ugly, things to praise, not things to curse. Church, it's time for us to change the way we think. So some of us may have some changes we need to think about this morning. We need to change about the way that we consider our relationship with Christ. And we've sung about Him, we've read about Him, but it's time to change the way we think that we do need to today recognize Jesus as Lord and Savior. We need to come to Him and be baptized for the forgiveness of our sins. It may be that some of us, that man, we have been weighed down by life's burdens. We need to seek the forgiveness of the Lord, ask the church to pray for us, and let's do that. But you know, church, we've got to change the way we think about some things. That we've got to allow people, when we have struggles, when we have difficulties, when we have burdens of the heart, that people can come and talk to us about that and ask us to pray about that. And we let them, and we pray about it, we don't look down on them. We encourage them, we don't talk about them. We want to be a people who want to draw closer to the Lord. And we share our burdens with one another because we want to change. We want to change the way we live and we want to change the way we think. And so this morning, if we can help you in any way, we invite you to come to the front. Let's stand and let's sing.